Hello and welcome to our live telephone town hall meeting, the city of Mercer Island. This is a live tele-town hall and welcome to it. Those of you who are on so far, we're dialing out to thousands of households in the city of Mercer Island and we'll be getting started with our live forum in just a moment here. Uh, in the meantime, I'll tell you how you can participate in this live tele-town hall. So uh, as you're listening, we'd like you to be submitting questions to our live forum, and you can do that at any time by pressing zero on your phone. Uh, again, you press zero just to submit a question, and if you prefer not to ask your question live, you'll be speaking to an operator before we bring you up, and you can tell them you prefer to have me read it if you don't want to ask it yourself, and I'm happy to do that, whatever's most comfortable for you. So this is going to be a live forum, and we're going to go uh, for hopefully an hour if we have enough participation from you folks in our phone audience. and um, you'll be able to listen in and participate not just by submitting questions, but also by voting in some survey questions that we have for you. So stick around for those, even if you don't have a question, listen as your neighbors ask questions and as we give you answers, and also stay tuned for those survey questions. So I'm gonna go, ho go ahead and go through this introduction just one more time, and we'll go ahead and get started. Again, welcome to the City of Mercer Island Telephone Town Hall Meeting. We're here tonight to talk about the city's budget challenges and to answer your questions. This is a live forum, so what will really drive this conversation is your questions and concerns. And so we'd love to take your questions live, and you can do that by pressing zero on your phone. Now, if you prefer not to ask your question live, you should still press zero and submit your question, but let your operator know that you want me to read your question instead of asking it live in the forum, and I'm happy to do that for you. You can also press seven to give us your email for email updates from the city of Mercer Island. And if you're on the audio webcast, you can type your email into the leave a comment box at the bottom right of your control platform, and we'll add it to our email update list. We want to keep you better informed moving forward, so again, please press 7 on your phone to give us your email address to get updates. We'll send you the MI Weekly e-newsletter moving forward to keep you informed. Uh, of course, you can also visit the city website at mercergov.org for, for more information. That's mercergov.org for information. From the home page, you can click on the Financial Challenges box on the right. And uh, when we get to the end of this forum, if you have any additional thoughts or questions, I'll tell you how you can leave us a message. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to turn it over to City Manager Julie Underwood. Go ahead, please, Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Underwood, City Manager for Mercer Island, and I've been with the city since January of this year. I came from a city in California, but before that, I was City Manager for Shoreline, Washington. My husband and I and our three boys are excited to be back in the Northwest and part of this special community. And I'd like to welcome you all to Mercer Island's first ever Telephone Town Hall. I'm joined tonight by our city's finance director, Chip Quarter as well as our fire and police chiefs and every department head in the city. One of our mandates from our elected city council is to be good communicators and good listeners too, so that Islanders are really helping us shape how the city runs, and we're excited to do that. We already know from surveying our community that a strong majority of Islanders feel the city is doing a good job overall and doing a good or excellent job in using taxpayer dollars responsibly. We appreciate that endorsement and are working very hard to keep City Hall accessible and responsive to you. The topic of tonight's forum is our city budget and the problems we face there, and more on that in a minute. All right. Thank you very much, Julie. We're going to run a survey question, the first of many, and you'll be able to vote on this using your touchtone phone. So go ahead and listen in and then vote on your phone as we go. Our first survey question for you is, before you heard about tonight's telephone town hall, were you aware the city was facing major budget, budget challenges? Press 1 for yes, you were aware of that. Press 2 for no, you, wasn't, you weren't aware. Press 3 for you're not sure or you don't know. Thank you, and again, I'll read those options as you vote. Again, we were, uh, were you aware before tonight's forum that the city faces a major budget challenge? Press 1 for yes, 2 for no, and three if you're not sure or you don't know. Julie, back to you. I want to encourage you to stay on the line because we're going to get to Q&A very shortly. But before that, um, before answering your questions, we'd like to, oops, sorry, please don't, uh, please don't feel like you need to be interested in budgets or finances to be part of this important conversation, whether you depend on our police and fire services, our parks, trails, our play fields, 
our recreation programs for kids, our street paving, or the amazing student and family programs offered by the city's Youth and Family Services Department. The city budget directly affects you and your family. And of course, as a taxpayer, it affects your pocketbook. As a reminder, if you have a question for us tonight, press zero anytime, or if you're on the audio webcast, type in your question. With that, I'd like to ask Chip Quarter, our finance director, to give a very brief overview of the budget problems our city is facing, and then we'll get right to your question. Okay. Julie knows that asking me to describe the city's budget situation in just a few minutes is a tall order, but I'll do my best to boil things down to the essentials. For those that are interested in more detail, there will be a number of opportunities to attend longer community meetings in January to April 2018. For tonight, however, I recognize that most people simply want the short version. So over the next two minutes, I'll cut to the chase and save the details for the Q&A. To steal an off-quoted line from the movie Apollo 13, Houston, we have a problem. Starting in 2019, we are projecting a $2 million operating deficit. That means our revenues are going to be $2 million short of what's needed to maintain the services currently provided by the city. That deficit is projected to grow every year up to $7.4 million by 2024. What is driving these projected deficits? Simply put, annual revenue growth is not keeping pace with annual expense growth. Why not? Property taxes, which are the city's largest revenue source, are capped by state law at 1% growth per year. Expenses, on the other hand, are projected to grow 4 to 5% per year. To maintain current service levels, a new ongoing revenue source is needed, such as a property tax levy bid lift, which would require voter, voter approval. Otherwise, significant service cuts will be required. I want to point out that Mercer Island isn't the only King County city facing budget challenges. Bellevue, Kirkland, Redmond, and Bothell are projecting operating deficits in 2019 as well. As a result of the 1% uh, property tax growth cap, many cities have gone to or will need to go to their voters with a property tax levy to live to maintain current service levels. There are four facts I hope our residents will find useful if they try to digest this information and get more informed. First, our city's property tax rate is the lowest of any King County city with a population of 20,000 or more. As a result, a Mercer Island homeowner will pay less property tax to the city than any other homeowner in King County will pay to his or her city given the same assessed value. Second, compared to other full-service cities in King County, Mercer Island is one of the most leanly staffed relative to population. Third, the city has received clean audit opinions from the State Auditor's Office for the last 22 years, which is a good financial management indicator. Fourth, the city has a AAA bond rating, which allows us to issue debt, when necessary, for capital projects at the lowest possible interest rates. All that said, we are still looking at budget forecasts with growing deficits and we need to find a fix soon. Thanks, Chip. We know folks are on the line and have a lot of questions, so we'd like to get right to them. Absolutely. Thank you, Julie. And for those of you who may have just joined our call, if you have a question that you'd like to ask uh, about the city budget, we're happy to answer those questions through the remainder of this live forum. Just press zero on your phone if you'd like to submit a question. Um, and if you're on the web, you can use the leave a comment button at the bottom right of your control platform to submit a question, uh, just like Ken did. And here's Ken's question. Ken says, we have heard from some previous city council candidates that our entire city is in dire straits, facing a huge deficit. This is extremely depressing to hear. And if we believe them, we are concerned that all our city services will be curtailed as a result of the huge deficits that they said were imminent. Is this true? Who do you want to, uh, Julie or Chip, who'd like to start in on Ken's question? Um, I think Chip would be able sure. to answer that. You bet. Well, first of all, it's important to know that our budget, our operating budget, is balanced through 2018. We had to use one-time money to do it, but the bottom line is it is balanced. So services are, are fully funded through that period of time. We're projecting deficits beginning in 2019. $2 million is significant relative to, relative to a $30 million budget. Um, that's a little bit less, about 8% or so, um, but we have time between now and next year to work with the community, get them educated, and explain their options. So I would describe it as dire, but it's certainly um, uh, the deficits are just around the corner. Got it. Thank you so much, Chip. 
And uh, we'll go to another question in just a moment, but I wanted to remind everybody that may have just joined us, you are on with City Manager Julie Underwood and Finance Director Chip Corder. They're here to answer your questions about the City of Mercer Island's uh, budget. So if you have questions on the phone, please press zero on your phone right now. Uh, we're going to go to Eric's question from our web audience in just a moment, but first I have another survey question for you. We've got a few more of these, so stick around to vote in those. Overall, do you think the city provides, press one, about the right amount of services, two, not enough services, or press three, for too many services? Again, overall, do you think the city provides, press one, for about the right amount of services, press two, for not enough services, and press three, for too many services? And while you're voting on that survey, we'll go ahead and get Eric's question in here from the web. Eric says, if every small town in Washington is suffering under a state law limiting recapturing growth to 1% per year, should all of the small towns put pressure on the state lawmakers to share the property tax upsides? Who would like to take on um, that question? Yeah, actually, that's a great question. Um, many cities in the state belong to the Association of Washington Cities. We've um, really collectively tried to work with our legislatures to um, really come up with a fix, a remedy, something that would allow cities to um, really have local control and find other revenue sources or look at the 1% um, cap. So um, it is something cities are, as he said, all over the state struggling with the 1% um, cap is is just not enough to keep up with the cost of really inflation. So it is something we're looking at, but um, it's not easy to get legislators to really get behind it. And um, so the, if you have ideas for us to help move the needle on that, I am so open to listening to those. Great. Thank you, Julie. And yeah, for anybody who has any comments as well, um, we're taking questions and comments in this live forum. So press zero with any of those. And for those of you on the web, again, you can use the leave a comment button at the bottom right of your screen. Uh, here's our next question for you. Has the city considered ways it can, quote, tighten its belt? Have you looked at cutting expenses? Yeah, I, this is one of those um, where I've only been in the city for less than a year, and so I wasn't around during the Great Recession, but I know Chip can talk to some of the things the city had to do um, that starting then, and of course we've had to continue going forward. I guess what I would add is we really, I've been here for over 12 years. This particular city has a very, very lean culture, not only in terms of its staffing, but also in terms of its spending habits. I often liken our city to a, a car, and the one I pick is the Honda Civic, but without leather. And it's with no frills, completely barely power windows. Um, in terms of the Great Recession, uh, like other cities, we had to cut a number of positions. We were more fortunate than other cities, and uh, we've been able to restore some, but not all of those positions. And so that, that uh, you know, honestly, since the Great Recession, um, We've never really had any fat, but if, if we had any fat, it was taken away by the Great Recession. There was no fat in this organization. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that answer, and thanks for that question. Let's go to our first live question from our phone audience. This is from Istvan. Go ahead, please, Istvan. Istvan, are you there? Can you hear us? Okay. I'll go ahead and read Istvan's question. The question is, I am looking at the projections of growing deficits. What if we use the expenses instead of looking for more money? Can you take on that question? Um, maybe Chip can answer that. Sure. I, I, I assume what is being referred to is what if we balance the budget on the expenditure side of the equation by cutting services. And if that's the case, then what we would have to do, just looking at 20, again, we're balanced through 2018, but as you look into the next biennium, we do biennial budgets here, 2019 and 2020, we actually would have to cut 25 employees. Now, that's about 12% of our workforce. As you look over a six-year period, 2019 through 2024, we'd have to cut 52 employees or uh, one quarter of our workforce. That is significant. And that's always an option. It's on the table. We'll be engaging the community regarding those options and what are the challenges and what that might look like. But uh, that is on the table. 
Got it. Thank you very much. We'll go to our next question in just a moment here, but I'm going to run another survey question first. The question is, I would be in favor of paying more property taxes to maintain current level of services. If you strongly agree with that, press 1. If you somewhat agree, press 2. If you somewhat disagree, press 3. If you strongly disagree, press 4. And if you're not sure, you don't know, press 5. Here's our question again. I would be in favor of paying more property taxes to maintain current levels of services. Press 1 if you strongly agree with that position. Press 2 if you somewhat agree. 3 if you somewhat disagree. 4 if you strongly disagree. And 5 if you're not sure or you don't know. Go ahead and vote on that now. We're going to go to our next question. Um, this one is going to be, sorry, let me get it in front of you. Uh, I wonder if we overpay our city staff and if we pay too much for benefits. Has the city looked at ways to pare back there? Um, I'm going to ask Chris Siegel, our HR director, to respond to that question. So um, and the question is, have we looked into ways to pair that back? And I mean, the short answer is yes. We're always looking at ways in which we can um, be more responsible with our compensation policies. But I think um, what's important to note is what our compensation policies are. And uh, we pay all of our employees, regardless of whether they're um, represented by a union or not, at the midpoint or the 50th percentile of the market. So what that means, what's the market? It's uh, 10 surrounding cities that um, have some common elements um, that make them, you know, like employers. And so we're not at the top, we're not at the bottom, we're, we're right smack dab in the middle. And there's some um, state law regarding, on, re regarding our represented employees that require us to pay at the midpoint of the market. So really, um, we can't affect the salaries of our union employees um, without, well, without um, coming up against state law and then ultimately even having to pay that in, in the, anyway. And so, um, so yes, yeah, so I, I would say that our pay policies are, are responsible. Um, we also, when you look at our benefits costs, we are always looking at ways that, um, you know, we can provide decent benefits for our employees, but also be responsible about the cost. And when you compare us to our comparable, our, comp, our market, comparable market, um, we're one of the lowest in how we provide or the cost that we provide our benefits. Um, so, in that regard, I would say that we are responsible. Great. Thank you very much. Great answer. Let's get to our next live question. Can I just add, add one thing onto that, Ian? Yes, yeah, go ahead. Is, it, one of the things we're trying to balance is we have a really good workforce and, and our employee turnover is, is low. And to the extent that our salaries at midpoint and benefits at the bottom of the market, if we were to lower either or both of those, we run the risk of greater employee turnover. And so that's also kind of one of the things we're trying to balance. And if there's greater employee turnover, there's going to be a reduction level of service. Got it. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got a lot of questions. We've got Tim live next. Tim, you're up on the line. Go ahead, please, sir. You just answered my question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I appreciate it, really. Do you, do you have any follow-up or are you good? Well, you know, look, people, a lot of people have discussed this issue of the vacation bank. Maybe you could just discuss that. You bet. Any implications of that? So yeah, this is Chris Siegel, the Human Resources Director, and, and I think there's some information that's going around that that doesn't align with what we actually do provide. So um, for our employees, what they get um, it's a tiered system. So when you start here, and you're within your first five years of employment, you get one, you earn one day of vacation per month, and so 12 days per year. And that goes up as you um, as your tenure goes up, but it caps out at um, 21 days per year for a 16-year employee plus. So, so that's the maximum amount of vacation that's earned per year. And then we also cap the maximum that you can carry a balance. So, no employee is allowed to, or can carry more than 240. Hours and there's a little bit different limits for our police and fire, but generally with it, 240 to 280 is the maximum amount of vacation that you can have at any given time. So, um, 
so, so there's that. I think that one of the things that gets added to the leave um, as the community is talking to it is sick leave. So our employees also earn sick leave, and it's one day per month. But that's not you don't. That's more of an insurance policy. So your vac your sick leave is there if something happens to you or a member of your family, and you need to take care of them. That's when you use it. So it's not added to the leave. You know your your entitled leave. Can you cash it out? And you cannot cash out your sick leave. So once you leave the city, um, your sick leave is gone, just like an insurance policy. You either used it or you didn't, and so it goes away. And um, and, and and a lot of our surrounding cities do allow for cash outs, and we do not for any of our employee groups. Yeah, and I think it's important to really stress there is a cap on leave. I, having come from California, I came from a city where there was not a cap on leave. And actually, when um, when employees would leave employment of the city, it would not be um, uncommon for taxpayers to write checks of upwards of um, six figures. And so that, to me, is like putting money on the table and setting fire to it. We're not doing that here. We do have a cap, and we are very mindful of really not growing that liability um, on our book. I just want to add one more thing. This is Chip again. You know, from an employee perspective, most people want to take their vacation. And so when we've had leave balances accumulate, that's a concern. And it begs the question, well, why is that? It's usually because they're too busy. We're so thinly staffed. When someone's out, it makes it hard for someone else to go on vacation. And so that's not about people trying to hoard vacation. It's just about... It's really difficult workload. to find windows of time to. It's about workload and finding windows of time to go out and take your vacation. Got it. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, we did have a caller ask that everybody identify themselves before they speak because they're having trouble telling the difference between uh, who's who's speaking when. So if you wouldn't mind doing that moving forward. Will do. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from our webcast audience, and this is from Craig. He says. Uh, are the current forecasts of revenue and expenses for the next 10 years available to the public? This is Chip. Uh, I haven't gone out 10 years. I've just gone out six years, and I, I guess technically it's seven years. We consider 18 through 2024. It's really hard going out 10 years, but uh, the bottom line is the kind of the patterns, the percentage change in revenues and expenditures. I, I'm assuming revenues will grow at about 2.3% per year and expenses, expenditures will grow at about 4.8%. I, I would extend that projection out, you know, the, the additional four years, if you would. But it's available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I, I, don't, I don't have anything online for 10 years. I've just gone out six years and that's through 2024, and that is available. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to take our next question from the web as well. This comes from Jeff. He asks, what other revenue opportunities are available to the city? User fees, uh, one-time levies, anything like that? I guess it's Chip again. <laughs> uh, very few tools um, uh, in my toolbox in terms of that. Uh, one of the things we could do is a utility tax. We already have that on our own utilities, on our water, sewer, and stormwater utilities. The current rate is 5.3%. We could increase that, say, to 10.3. That I, I say that to, to make a point. So that's a huge increase. That would only generate $875,000 a year. Well, that's less than the $2 million projected deficit uh, I have for 2019. It do, it's not a big enough revenue slice, if you will, uh, to solve the problem. And so really you have to go after our biggest revenue source, which is property tax, at 40% of our total general fund revenues to crack the problem and that's why we've been talking about a, a levy lid lift where you go to the voters and increase the property tax levy amount. Got it. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, let's run another survey question before we d get to our next question uh, from our audience. This question is, uh, again, this is another agree-disagree question for you. I would prefer to see the city scale back its services and programs rather than ask for an increase in property taxes. Press 1 if you strongly agree. Press 2 if you somewhat agree. Press 3 if you somewhat disagree. Press 4 if you strongly disagree. And press 5 if you're not sure or you don't know. Again, the uh, question is, I would prefer to see the city scale back its services and programs 
rather than ask for an increase in property taxes. Press 1 if you strongly agree with that statement. Press 2 if you somewhat agree. Press 3 if you somewhat disagree. Press 4 if you strongly disagree. And press 5 if you're not sure or you don't know. And I'll remind folks that uh, if you have a question you want to submit in this forum or a comment that you'd like to submit, press 0 on your phone. We've got our next live question. This comes from Dwight. Hey, Dwight, you're live on the line. Go ahead, please, sir. Yeah, the um, you say that you uh, have reduced employment. Can you tell me how many city employees outside of the planning department uh, there have been uh, 5, 10, and 15 years ago compared to now? Planning department, as my understanding, is pretty much self-funded. For the most part, yes. So you're asking how many have we added or how many have we cut? What, I'm asking what the total is. Oh, the total. Yeah, the total currently, and this include, uh, includes our contract employees. They're on like two-year contracts. And th this does include planning. Is 207 employees total. And, and, and that, that's, yeah, that's what it is currently, 207. Well, was we it just 5, 10, and 15? Oh, I don't have my magic cheat sheet in front of me on that. It would probably be 180 something, 170 something. It's probably Chris, do you remember? Yeah, I, I, it's more around the 185. Um, this is Chris, Human Resources Director. Um, around, it's it's uh, fluctuated within the last 15 years between 185 to 200, just over 200, and it kind of goes back and forth, and, and that, that includes the planning staff. Um, to pull them out and to give you those numbers, I'd have to actually um, go look at some data, but off the top of my head, um, it's, it's kind of stayed around those, that area for, those, for the period of time you asked about. Great, thank you very much. Appreciate that, Dwight. Thank you very much for your question. Let's go to our live audience again for this next question. This comes from TJ. Hey, TJ, you're up. Thank you. Um, I think Chip answered my question, but I'm going to repeat it because what he basically said was that revenues are going up about 2% and costs are going up 4%. And I'd like to change my question because I was just asking what were costs doing versus revenues and why are costs exceeding your revenue growth? You know, typically in a private sector, if revenues are going to go down, you're going to reduce costs somehow, some way because, right. you, you know, you can't sell more if nobody's buying the product. So um, what, what, are, what in the cost sector is, or cost element is going up, for, going up at a higher rate than your revenues? Right. Uh, this is Chip again. And so because we're a service organization and 71% uh, of our general fund costs are in people, salaries and benefits. And my experience uh, in the public and the private sector is, generally speaking, and when inflation's right around 3% or more, your personnel costs go up about 4 to 5% a year. That's our experience here in this city, and that's what the big driver is. And, well, and this is Julie, and, those, and it's being driven by, obviously, and many of our residents are affected by this, too, um, increasing costs of health insurance, um, and, of course, you know, COLA, cost of living adjustments, those types of things. Um, we are a ser service provider, and so it, it really is our staff, our team of employees that um, are the majority of our expenditures. Let me just tag on to that. This kind of, it begs the question, well, how, have we, how have we made ends meet uh, over the past you know, five, six-plus years? It's really been primarily development activities. Been, we hit all-time records in 15 and 16 in terms of activity level and revenues generated, especially construction-related sales tax. That's a temporary blip. That bought us time and it's allowed us to push this deficit out into 2019. Um, and there's a handful of other things the council has done to take actions to help here and there, but that's really the biggest reason it's made the difference on the revenue side. Got it. All right. Thank you very much, TJ. Appreciate you being on. We're going to go to Mark next, and then we'll have another survey question for you. Hey, Mark, you're up. Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. I was just wondering uh, if the city owns any real estate that they could uh, sell to raise money. I, I, I could answer that, but I would get crucified. <laughs> Pioneer Park. <laughs> we would never sell that wonderful open space. Uh, 
Um, I, I don't have any good ideas on property that we would sell that isn't already open space or park related land. Yeah, this is Julie. I, I haven't really heard um, the council or certainly staff mention the if there's any surplus property that would really generate $7 million plus dollars um, to buy us out of the deficit. Um, I, I can't imagine our resident being okay with selling off parkland. Um, and really when I think about other service um, sites, you know, we need our fire station, so I can't imagine selling those off. And I certainly, um, we, we do need a city hall and a public works um, corporate Corp yard, so I, I, I'm struggling with really trying to identify. Really, is there anything we would our community would be okay with surplusing? I'm not sure about that. Um, yeah. Great, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate your question. Let's go to another survey next, and then we'll have another question from our web participant audience. This is another agree disagree question. I would be in favor of paying more property taxes to pay for high priority capital projects and deferred maintenance. Press one if you strongly agree with that statement. Press two if you somewhat agree. Press three if you somewhat disagree. Press four if you strongly disagree. And press five if you're not sure or you don't know. Again, I would be in favor of paying more property taxes to pay for high priority capital projects and deferred maintenance. Press one if you strongly agree with that statement, two if you somewhat agree, three if you somewhat disagree, four if you strongly disagree, and five if you're not sure. And our next question is from Ken on the web, and he asks, are counselors still going to be paid, uh, paid for by Mercer Island Youth and Family Services? Oh, well, we can take that I, one? Yeah, Chip will take that. Sure. Um, so, one of the great things that makes Mercer Island unique is having mental health school counselors and who are, and it's not really understood by most of the community, they are YFS or city employees, youth and family services employees. Um, the, uh, right now, they are funded um, almost entirely by the city with the exception of $60,000, which comes from the school district annually. Otherwise, they're funded by uh, $400,000 in tax support from the general fund, and the balance comes from thrift shop sales in the island. So uh, what was the other part of the question that I'm, I'm just basing on at the moment? Will they continue to be funded by the city? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that, that's the expectation, is we think it makes sense when you're talking mental health counselors for them to continue to be city employees versus school employees. Also, with the change in uh, uh, school funding in the state with what's called a McCleary fix. That complicates things. I don't know that the school district would be in a position to uh, increase their levy to cover the cost of that. So as, as near as I can, as I understand things, that really falls to the city. Got it. Thank yeah, you. And, uh, one of my cohorts is reminding me, it's an excellent, being on island, whether your taxes go to the school district or go to the city, it's, it's still the same taxpayers. And so it doesn't really matter you know, who you pay your taxes to, it's it's going to be the same amount regardless. Got it. Thank you so much. Uh, our next question, and uh, thank you, Ken, for submitting that question on the web. Our next question is from Dwight on the web, and the question is, uh, what is the average tenure of employees? And Dwight actually has a second question, who determines the services the city is currently providing? Chris will answer that first question. Yeah, Chris, Human Resources Director. So um, the average tenure is around uh, bet between 10 to 15 years. And so and by it changes, it's, it's different by department. So our um, public safety departments, um, which is traditional or common of all cities, is a lot, is higher. It's more like it's definitely toward the 15, 15 year, although now we're experiencing retirement, so that's um, changing a bit. But general, if you put, if you take out public safety employees, the it's the average is around 10 to 12, 15 years somewhere in there. And then there was a second part of that question. Um, so who de determines service levels? Service configuration. Right. Yeah. Who determines the services the city is currently providing? Right. Right. Actually, that is, this is Julie Underwood, um, city manager. That really is something determined by the city council when they adopt a budget. 
Um, oftentimes, um, every department is submitting um, their uh, budget, and it includes identifying service levels that they're providing. And really, at the end of the day, it's our elected officials that will adopt that budget. Oftentimes, they are listening to our residents, our community members, and trying to be responsive in providing service levels that meet what our residents um, would like and would like us to con continue providing. So it really, I think, try it, the, it's a budget that really tries to affect kind of the needs of the community. And again, at the end of the day, it's really um, approved and decided on by our city council. All right, great, thank you. Thank you for your questions, Dwight. Uh, our next question comes from an anonymous web user. Uh, how bad is the problem of deferred maintenance? Besides water and sewer, what else falls into that category? Does the budget, does the budget forecast provide any plan? Hmm. We're gonna invite our public works director to come take a shot while he's working his way. This is Chip again. Um, and, and we're really focused on, when we talk about our deficits, we're not talking about our water, sewer, stormwater utilities and there are maintenance issues there. We're really focused on our tax-funded services. And probably, if I had to pick the one thing, actually two things that were impacted the most um, in terms of deferred maintenance, it would be our right-of-way or street-related maintenance. We cut two and a half FTEs during the Great Recession time frame. We've only restored half of that two and a half FTEs. Uh, and also, just our public building maintenance. We have just two employees responsible for maintaining all of our buildings. I'm not referring to custodial work, I'm referring to actual building maintenance and just minor capital replacement. With that, I'll have Jason Kentner, our Public Works Director, CDA's meeting wants to add to that. I think Chip summarized it very well. Um, we had two and a half, reduc two and a half FTEs reduced in the right-of-way services group. The right-of-way team also is responsible for maintaining our stormwater utility, and so, um, I think what's unique within our organization is that we are a small group of individuals and we are cross-trained and crossed over into other bodies of work. Um, and we reprioritize on a regular basis, which it has an impact on our maintenance programs because as other things rise to the top, it causes us to push other routine maintenance activities aside to deal with the emergent issues. So um, on the water and sewer side, that's a different conversation. Right, and I just wanted to mention on the water sewer side, um, Jason and his team put together a, um, a pretty comprehensive capital program that looks at the life cycle of, of those facilities and creates a replacement plan. However, those are not funded by the general fund. They are funded by ratepayers. So those of us who have to buy wire, water and sewer, those those um, dollars are used to care for the capital investments in the water and sewer side. This is Chip again, just one more thing. In terms of when I look at infrastructure, non-utility infrastructure, there's really just, it's parks. And I'm reminded by our parks director, take Aubrey Davis Park, formerly Park on the Lid. That really is quite an old park and, and the whole trail, right, going from one bridge to the other. That is uh, long overdue for, uh, major replacement, uh, it is, is getting quite, quite old. And so there, there's just one example where it's really parks uh, that really, uh, there's, there's a lot of needs there. Got it, great, thank you very much. Uh, let's go to, we're gonna go to another question in a minute, but actually I wanted to mention we have about 20 minutes left in this live forum. And uh, if you want to get email updates from the city of Mercer Island moving forward, now's your opportunity to press seven on your phone to give us your email address and we'll keep you updated as we move forward. Again, if you're on the phone and you want to give us your email address, go ahead and push seven on your phone right now and we'll be happy to keep you updated via email. If you're participating on the web and you haven't already given us your email address, you can do that by uh, using the leave a comment button and just dropping your email address into there and we'll add it to the list as well. So thanks uh, in advance everybody for that participation as well. Our next question is, what is the timing of all of this? Uh, wow, okay, this is Julie. Um, that's a great question. Um, the timing of this is, well, first of all, let me start by saying that our city council really wants to hear from the community, wants to hear from the public, so we are gathering and convening a um, community advisory group, and they will come together 
um, starting this November and really uh, convening again in January through April. Um, we will also, of course, reach out to our community, um, community meetings, probably another telephone town hall. We will do a community survey in April. In um, June, we will present all of this information um, and the options to the city council. And then um, should they decide this is uh, an issue that should go to the voters, then it would be on the November 2018 ballot. And so, um, it, but of course, you know, this is, we're a good year out from that, but I, I think to have really a good and um, robust uh, citizen engagement process, um, we're excited to have all this time to be able to work with our community on some possible solutions. Got it, great. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, let's go to our next question. This comes from our web audience, and this is from Craig. Craig's question is, has the city examined the possibility of outsourcing police, fire, or other services to other cities? Oh, yeah. So um, we do have our, our um, police chief here. We have our deputy fire chief here. Um, we, as you noted, we are um, a a city that provides these services in-house. Um, contracting is a model that we will most likely look into. I've worked in other cities where we have contracted and that has worked out well. I think um, it isn't something, just to manage expectations here, it isn't something that I, I feel confident I could recommend um, happening for the start of 2019. So it does take some um, analysis, it takes quite a bit of work, and it, it isn't something that I think um, is a decision that can happen before we're facing the deficit. I, I think that, I don't want to make people assume that is something that can happen before then. However, I think it's quite possible that our community advisor, advisory group says it is something we need to examine and evaluate and consider. I just want to add one more thing. This is Chip again. We have looked from time to time, the fire chief and I, <clears throat> at a regional fire authority. And in essence, what if Bellevue and Mercer Island and maybe Kirkland, maybe a few other cities joined together and formed a separate jurisdiction, a fire authority outside of the cities. And there is some opportunity for some efficiencies uh, some savings there, reduction of apparatus, reduction of overtime, and just the preliminary look at that, and it's very preliminary, I would estimate that that would save the city in the short term of maybe three hundred, maybe $400,000 a year tops. That's significant. That's about a percent to 1.3% of our general fund budget, but it's not, it doesn't solve the whole problem, but it certainly would chip away at it, pun intended there. Um, <laughs> But that's a, that's a conversation where that's at least a two-year conversation with the community and with multiple cities and city councils where you're looking not only at the governance model, how people would be represented based on different populations and whatnot, but also the cost allocation model, you know, who should pay for how much of that service. And it's something that it's, we're trying to look at. We're just leanly staffed and haven't had a lot of time. We're still continuing those conversations, but it's kind of stay tuned. And again, that's really kind of a two-year plus conversation. Got it, thank you. Uh, our next uh, question is uh, actually some clarification and then a question. So Matt uh, says, quick clarification on some numbers. Revenues have been growing by 4%, and he says he believes that was a number he heard referenced, but property tax assessed values have been increasing by 9 to 10% over the last few years, and he references a report from the Casey area, Casey area report for Mercer Island uh, for that number. Now his question is, why aren't revenues increasing in line with the assessed value? Oh, that is a softball. I love that question. Um, this is Chip again. So on the revenue, what we're projecting, okay, so not projecting in terms of 19 and on out to 2024 is revenue growth of just a little over 2% driven by property tax, okay, the limits on property tax. 
Uh, in terms of assessed valuation, you're right. On Mercer Island, it's been going up by double digits for several years in a row, and it's going to go up by double digits again this year. Our median assessed value, uh, your kind of typical home in Mercer Island, is currently $1.2 million assessed value. Um, what's not understood by many folks is there's an assumption that if assessed value is going up by 10%, then therefore our property tax coming in is going up by 10%. No, it, it, it doesn't work that way. This 1% restriction applies to the amount of money, what's called the levy that the city receives. And so as assessed valuation goes up 10%, the property tax rate must correspondingly come down to ensure that the levy amount collected by the city, in other words, I can only collect 1% more next year than we collected this year. And so as AV goes up, assessed valuation goes up, the rate must come down for the city. So if our, this is Julie, so let's put it in some context. So if our levy dollar amount is 10 million, it can only grow by 1%, so that would mean it can only grow by- 100,000. 100,000, so that's it. And then basically, Chip takes that 10,000, I mean 10 million, um, 100, and then backs out of that to get that levy rate. So right now our levy rate is about a dollar eight. eight. So he starts with the big number and then backs out of that to get that levy rate. So it does seem counterintuitive that the AV is growing, so shouldn't um, property tax grow? But um, unlike other states across the United States where it is more in that, um, very similar to that process, that's not how it works in the state of Washington. There's a more complicated answer, but we don't have time to get into it tonight. But suffice it to say, in your property tax levy, there's lots of other jurisdictions. There's the county, there's the school district, the state school fund, the port, et cetera, the library. All those have pieces. So I'm just here to talk about the city portion of the levy, which is only 13% of your property tax levy. And that's limited to 1% growth in the amount paid. That doesn't apply to each homeowner. It applies to the total levy amount. Got it. Thank you again. All right. Our next question comes from Frank on the web. He asks, why can't we start addressing the deficit now while the budget is balanced and maybe create a surplus so the shortfall will be less? A man after my own heart. Uh, <laughs> I've been trying to do that. Um, it, it just comes down to major issue management. We've had major issue after major issue since at least 2014. Back then, we had uh, tolling on I-90. In 2015, we got into town center code update as we got into, uh, and that went through uh, 16, and then, then we got into residential code updates in, in, in 17. And, of course, the I-90 loss of mobility in terms of negotiations with sound transit and litigation there, consuming 16 and 17 as well. The bottom line is we're just too thinly staffed to handle multiple major issues at the same time. And it's also too much in our experience for the community to digest more than one major issue. So this has just kind of had to be queued up and wait its turn. If I, if I, were, if I were king, I would have made this conversation happen last year. There just wasn't room for it. But um, to add on to that, actually the city does have a reserve, so yeah. we do have savings, um, and we do have savings that could bridge for a very limited time. Got it. Thank you so much. Another great question. Thanks for those in our uh, participating audience for submitting all these excellent questions. Uh, I will mention that we have about 10 minutes left. Many of you did press 7 to give us your email address. We've cleared that queue, so if you still want to do that and give us your email address, go ahead and push 7 on your phone right now and give us your email so we can keep you updated uh, electronically moving forward. Our next question comes from our phone audience. This is from Stephen. Hey, Stephen, you're up. Go ahead. Hi there. So um, raising taxes and cutting spending are obviously a few ways to reduce deficits, but how about increasing revenue? And I'll give you an example of one, such as promoting business on Mercer Island, where obviously uh, you generate tax revenue. And I'll just give you a little color. So we're longtime residents and uh, more recent retailers. So we have an appreciation for sort of both sides of the equation. My first question would be, what is Mercer Island and or the Chamber doing to help promote business on Mercer Island? And you can make a simple observation of driving down uh, I-90 
and you basically see no signage for any retail on Mercer Island where you can drive anywhere in the country and see at least a sign for McDonald's and gas. And then, uh, you know, you could also have, uh, you know, Chamber of Commerce sort of signage up once you get off the highway, which is a different sort of thing. So, you know, at a minimum, that would be a start to help promote generation of revenue. And having a, a vibrant downtown core helps maximize the value on the island and everybody's property and, of course, generates revenue for the local community as well as for the state. And I did not pay him to say that. Uh, this is Chip again. I, I agree. Uh, I would love for that to happen. Realistically speaking, let me kind of frame things for, for folks. Um, car dealerships. would love to have a car dealership, but they're never going to locate here because they're already in Seattle and Bellevue. It's already covered. It doesn't make sense to locate. As much as I would love a Tesla dealership, for example, here on the island, they generate anywhere from $350,000 to $400,000 a year, a good car dealership. A Costco, those stores do annual revenues of over $100 million. They generate about a million dollars a year in sales tax revenue for a city. And so I'm, what I'm trying to frame for folks is that's the kind of numbers that are needed to begin to solve our problem. And that's just, in my experience, it's never going to happen on Mercer Island. We're always going to be small retail, which is wonderful. It adds to the quality of life. Uh, but in terms of generating significant sales tax revenue, it doesn't do that. Yeah, this is Julian. And let me add on, I mean, we really are a bedroom community. Um, we have a quaint, charming little town center with great retail and restaurants. But um, I think by design, by our comp plan design, our land use patterns, it is really not meant to be a huge um, retail uh, generator. In fact, um, I believe 15% of our uh, revenue sources are sales tax. So it's 18. I'm sorry, 18% is sales tax. So it's not a huge amount of our revenue source. We we need them. We need every bit of it, um, but it's not a huge amount compared to, for example, our property tax is 40% of our revenue. So a big big difference. Um, we do have a wayfinding uh, project that will be hopefully hitting the ground soon, and that will help. Um, visitors to our island find our town center and find our um, business district so hopefully that will improve some um, and we really are trying our best I think to support our businesses work with our chamber um, but it is a bit it is a bit uh, limited with um, again our land use and what we have available for various uh, retail and businesses and as you probably also know, we're not a big employer. Um, our residents really leave the island um, every morning, every day, and go to employment centers off the island. So that's, again, another um, example of how we are a bedroom, small town uh, community. All right, thank you very much. Uh, great question, Stephen. Thank you so much for your participation. Um, and we're going to run another survey question before we go to Roger's question live next. Uh, so this is another agree-disagree question. Uh, you can vote on your phone. I found tonight's telephone town hall helpful in learning about the city's financial challenges. Press 1 if you strongly agree with that statement. Press 2 if you somewhat agree with that statement. Press, uh, press 3 if you somewhat disagree with that statement. Press 4 if you somewhat if you strongly disagree with that statement, and press 5 if you're not sure. Again, I found tonight's telephone town hall helpful in learning about the city's financial challenges. Press 1 if you strongly agree with that, 2 if you somewhat agree, 3 if you somewhat disagree, 4 if you strongly disagree, and 5 if you're not sure. And we'll have one more survey question after this. Question from Roger. Hey, Roger, you're live. Go ahead. Thanks very much. Hey, Julie. Um, my question has is a great piggyback to the prior on revenue sources, and it links to the surrounding communities. And I saw, and I wish I could find it, but there was a study done on revenue per citizen for the surrounding uh, municipalities, Bellevue, Redmond, et cetera. And I saw numbers that exceeded like a five to one delta between revenue per citizen and like Bellevue compared to Mercer Island. I apologize if I'm in, inflating or understating those numbers. Point I'm trying to make is that the, the revenue sources in other cities seem to be significantly higher. You just commented on the bedroom community aspect. 
um, what can we do to improve revenue sources outside of property tax uh, to generate revenue? I'm thinking of things along the lines of, for instance, our neighbors in Bellevue have limited park space. We have excessive park space. Are there deals we can cut with the cities, uh, starting communities, that allow them access, which is public, they can use it anyways, but promote it in such a way that we can in some way generate some revenues or offset some expenses, like was discussed earlier with fire police and the regional transit authority or regional services grouping, some way where some revenue can offset uh, maybe our fees associated with those and thereby impact a reduction in spend. Uh, and also, secondarily, can we look at things like generating revenue? Um, when I grew up here on the island, uh, Luther Burbank was vibrant. Uh, it provided, um, you know, a great source of community on the docks. Those docks could be a revenue source uh, for us. The um, uh, there could, could be other methods of revenue through the parks and rec. I see there's 8% of our revenue coming through that. Uh, I'd just like to hear more about the city's consideration for growing revenues in those areas. Thank you. This is Chip, and I'm going to do a little bit of a, a tongue-in-cheek. Um, I, I agree. Most of the ideas that are out there, they, they help a tiny, tiny little bit. And when you're so leanly staffed, you're kind of looking for something more significant to really address the problem. Um, I would love somehow to get my, my hands on uh, Boeing jet lease revenues. I wish we could have that you know, emanate from, from Mercer Island. But uh, in terms of significant revenues, uh, I, I'm just not aware of any significant good ideas out there. With that, we're going to have uh, Bruce Fletcher, our Parks Director, uh, say something to your question. Yeah, hi, Bruce Fletcher, Parks and Rec Director. Uh, the citizens of Mercer Island love our parks, our trails, open space. And if we were to start talking about selling things or putting uh, businesses on our parks, I think that would be a, a discussion for the community. Um, currently, our my budget, 50% of my budget comes back in revenue, so we do generate quite a bit now, and um, <clears throat> we've tried to increase it each year, but there's only only so much we can do because we, we do provide a lot of service to the community, including a lot of free service, like mostly music in the park and summer, uh, summer celebration. So we will continue to look at ideas to make um, increased revenues, but boy, I tell you that the people I talk with love the parks, open space, and trails on this island. Great, thank you very much, uh, Roger. That was a great question. Thank you for uh, asking it so eloquently and, and for being a part of this forum. We've actually just about come to the end of our hour-long Pelotown Hall. So I'm going to run one more survey question. I'll tell you how to leave us some voicemail messages, and then I'll turn it over to Julie to take us to the close. Our final survey question for you is this. Do you think the city should hold telephone town halls in the future to talk with residents about important issues? Press 1 if you think yes, the city should continue holding telephone town halls. Press 2 if you think no, the city shouldn't hold more telephone town halls. And press 3 if you're not sure or you don't know. And uh, while you're voting on that, I'll let you know that we'll close out the call in just a minute here. And if you want to leave us a voicemail message with any additional thoughts, questions, or comments, if you feel your question didn't get answered, uh, stay on the phone, leave us that voicemail message. You'll be prompted just by staying on the line as I close out the call to press uh, one on your phone to leave us a message. And when you leave those messages, if you need somebody at the city to get back to you, be sure to leave your name and contact information so we know where to reach back out to answer that question or to address any issues you may have. So uh, stay around to leave those voicemails if you have them. And with that, I'll turn it back over to City Manager Julie Underwood to take us to the end. Go ahead, Julie. Thanks, Ian. I just want to thank all the participants that um, joined us this evening. I want to thank my awesome team here um, who helped uh, back us up on questions. And um, again, if you would like to learn more about this, please vis uh, visit the city's website. We will have many, many, many other opportunities to get your input about how we can address our financial challenges. So thank you on behalf of all of us at the City of Mercer Island.